Good evening. My name is Kenya Taylor. Uh, I serve as the Associate Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs at UNK. And I am so pleased to welcome you to tonight's conference. Uh, the theme for this conference is Migration, Borders, and Identity, Building Bridges and Walls. Presenters are here from around the globe. They include senior diplomats, ambassadors, and representatives from international organizations. We are most grateful to have the opportunity to host them here at UNK and in Kearney. <coughs> Our speaker for tonight is Mr. Rick Mahara. He is a comedian and nationally acclaimed speaker, award-winning screenwriter, performer, director, <coughs> and author with credits in film, television, theater, Broadway, and media. He addresses through comedy topics such as diversity, entertainment, media, politics, and more, and has spoken at the most prestigious corporations, universities, and organizations in America. Currently, Mr. Nahara is a writer and guest star on Hulu's Emmy-nominated original series, East Lost High, and also directs the CBS Diversity Sketch Comedy Showcase for the 11th consecutive year. He directs and oversees the show in its entirety, mentoring the actors, teaching writing and stage performance, and, pre and presenting the most important showcase of talent in the industry. His fourth book, Almost White, Forced Confessions of a Latina in Hollywood, has received national attention. He signed a copy for me tonight, and I'm very Good. excited to have that. Uh, and his writing and acting credits also include the stage play, Latino Logs on Broadway. He is one of only three Latinos to ever write and star in their own play on Broadway. We're most fortunate to have him at UNK. Please welcome Mr. Rick Nahara. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Rick Nahara is a creative force, and when he speaks, Rick Nahara is a creative force, and when he speaks, people listen. And we're going to start things off with Rick Nahara. Rick Nahara. Rick Nahara. Rick Nahara. He's an award-winning writer, actor, director, producer, comedian, actor, and director. Writer with credits in film, television, theater, and Broadway. He's now written a memoir about his experiences in a new book called, love this title, Almost White. Armed with only a pen and a Mexican last name, he's mostly brown but chooses to be almost white. I'm writing on a show called East Los High, and it's a Hulu show, and it's getting huge numbers. So it just goes to tell you the power of the web and also the power of the Latino audience. But it's a huge market. There's 53 million Latinos, 2 trillion in, in, in buying power. It's amazing. Fireball. I've worked for CBS for 10 years doing the Diversity Showcase. Of the showcase, 32 series regulars have come out of it. Three have gone on to Saturday Night Live, and two have gone on to The Daily Show. That's incredible numbers. That's directed by a Latino, directed by me. The CBS Diversity wow. Showcase! What I do is I knock on the trunk of the car. Now, this works for Mex Mexicans. cannot resist this. You knock on the trunk of the car, you go, Que viva Mexico! Viva, viva, viva! <laughs> The critically acclaimed play Latino Laws made Rick Nahara one of only three Latinos in history to write and star in their own show on Broadway. I said, baby, 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 I'm a fireball. I, I'm Mexican-American, quite proud of it. Uh, I grew up uh, in La Mesa, California next to El Cajon, California. La Mesa means the table, El Cajon means the box, which means basically our Franciscan friars really had no sense of imagination whatsoever. <laughs> they just named things by what they saw. Um, so I grew up there, and, and I wanted to talk about the border because I wanted to make it more of a personal story. Uh, first of all, I can give you all sorts of statistics and we'll bore the heck out of you about that, but I don't think people put a face on the border, on who we are. Um, I say there's far more similarities between us all than differences. That's the way I look at it. In fact, coming here to Nebraska, 
was unique for me because my mother, believe it or not, is from Boone, Iowa. Boone, Iowa, that's right. I grew up on good Midwestern food. I grew up on string beans, uh, ham, corn on the cob, ambrosia salad, all wrapped in a flour tortilla. <laughs> that was my life. So I grew up there because my family basically came from Chihuahua, Mexico, and, and they left during the revolution, right before the revolution, because Pancho Villa's men had come to our ranch and started counting our cattle. And so that is basically an audit by Pancho Villa's army was a bad signal for my great-great-grandfather. So we took our 10 sons and daughters and crossed the border on a little cattle drive and went to New Mexico. Cal uh, New Mexico. In New Mexico, we had a place called Alamogordo White Sands Missile Range, which they eventually took away from us and were left with only 200 acres left of the Nehera land. And the 200 acres that we actually made into a pig farm just to bug all the Anglos in that neighborhood because there's a golf course right next to it. So we, we, put, we still raise pigs. That's our, our New Mexico story. My grandmother and my mother came from Aguas Calientes, and they were railroad people. They grew up in the railroad. And a lot of Mexicans who come to the Midwest, they come up here through the railroads. And sure enough, my, my grandmother had, with her family, were in Texas, they went to Texas, and they were rude to them, and they fell asleep, and they woke up in Boone and said, screw it, let's just live here. So they did. <laughs> and that's how we ended up in Boone, Iowa. So I really grew up like a Midwesterner. So coming back here, I, I feel very akin to all the Midwestern people I see. And that's another point I want to make. As Americans, we come in every size, shape, and color. And as Latinos, we come in every size, shape, and color as well. In fact, mostly large size because we love fried food. It's a little problem with our people. We have uh, fried food. We have lechong. We have all these great foods. And a lot of times, the fear out there, especially now in the presidential election, and I'm glad you can come here and not go to the debate because you don't have to fact check me that much. <laughs> but I will say this is that I see the patriotism among Latinos. Latinos are the future of America. We're a young demographic. So whether we are educated versus incarcerated will decide all our collective future, how we see ourselves. And I think it's the embrace of the immigrant that comes to this country, the embrace of someone that is the other that comes here. That shows who we are as a country. It shows who we are. Now, a lot of times when people look at me and they may say, well, you're Latino. You grew up in San Diego, California. I grew up 15 miles from the border. I could see the border there. And uh, you can bring that sign up. If you look at that sign, that was a sign that I would see there every single day when I'd drive up to Los Angeles from San Diego. That sign is telling you not to cross the border, basically. It's a caution sign. Do you see it? Have you ever seen this sign before? I don't know if many. How many people have seen this sign? Oh, good. Then I'm really bringing something new to Nebraska. This is a sign a hundred, about 50 miles up from the border. So when you see it, if you look at it, it's a really not even a very good sign of Mexicans. Because first of all, the man is running this way. And he's not even holding his wife's hand. He's out there looking for a job to steal from an American, and he's running quick. <laughs> There he is, now stealing a job from an American. And think about it, it's kind of hard to steal a job from an American. If you come to a country and you have very little language skills, very little uh, acquaintances, you know nobody, and you can steal a job from an American, that must be a really stupid American, no offense. <laughs> because I've never been to, went to CBS and had an undocumented person going, I took your job, I took it, I, I'm now the director of CBS, I'm happy, I don't know how I got it, but I got the job. <laughs> It was easy, they just give you jobs when you cross the border, they give you jobs, free Medicare, all these things that people tell you that undocumented people get, and they don't get them. They don't get them at all, surprisingly. Now look at this, the, the wife is running, and one, they had high heels before, which is really stupid, because who runs across a freeway with high heels? And if you look at the next thing, little daughters with, with little ponytails, which signal indigenous. So we have that with the indigenous and the European within the Mexican culture. And you look at that, she's got little ponytails and she's got the indigenous blood and there she is running across, being dragged across with her mother. She's an anchor baby, she's able to move, she's ready there to help him out. All those Im uh, symbolism is there. All those images are there. And in fact, they put that, that sign up there about 50 miles into the border. And it's there, and every time you go by, you see that sign. And the odd thing about that sign, they put that sign there because undocumented people were crossing at the border checkpoint, crossing the freeway, and over 150 had been killed crossing the freeway. Now here's an interesting thing. In Mexico, which is Spanish language, only 10% of Mexico doesn't speak Spanish at all. 
They speak indigenous language. They speak Nahuatl. They speak Olmec. They speak actual languages. They have nothing to do with Spanish. So if you're an undocumented person crossing the border, coming up thousands of miles from Guatemala or wherever it is, to look for a job, to avoid a narco killing you and all the other things, or a situation of looking to help your family, you see that sign and you think to yourself, this is where I cross. And that's why another thing. That becomes the, the problem with really looking at policy. And when you look at policy, you think about it and you say, wait a minute. Policy is to serve a, make a solution. And when I say Latino, who do you see? You might see me, right? You might see me or you may not see me. You may see someone else. Because the media tells you what Latino is. The media tells you what Latino is and the politicians tell you what Latino is and they'll say the Latinos are the problem. Latinos are the problems, but I say Latinos are never the problem. They are the solution. Why do I say solution? Look at myself. And making this a personal story about growing up on the border, you grow up on the border and you watch the border, and there's a border fence that goes all the way into the ocean from San Diego to Tijuana. I remember looking at the border fence going all the way into the ocean. I saw two dolphins go over the fence into the ocean. I said, how beautiful. Oh my God, has anyone seen that? These are corrugated steel structures that go into the ocean. And it puts up signs, don't, don't cross, you'll get caught in a, a riptide in Spanish and English, and sometimes people do. And they cross over there. And then you see on the other side of, of, of this park, you'll see a, a fence, a fence. And then you'll see families with their pictures because they can never cross the border. And they're showing other family members across the fence, their families. And some people have never touched for years. All they can do is maybe put a finger through the fence and touch and see their families. And when you think about that, that sounds pretty horrible. But the Mexicans that people are seeing, or the people on the border, what they're seeing is it's almost this terrible crowd ready to cross over. Look what the presidential candidates say. Rapists, murderers, and drug lords. And I suppose some of them are good people. I've never been a rapist. I was too busy working, so that never happened. I was never a drug lord because I was really bad at math. And uh, <laughs> I've never been any of those things. In fact, I've been along with my family, good American citizens. You look at that and I look at that and I, I think of, of just the history, because history is so important. History reminds us of our own humanity and our shared humanity. And my parents, my family, who's Mexican. Now when I grew up, this is a true story. This is going to get a little edgy here just to hear this story. And, and I know when I say this word, people get upset. But I need to tell the story, so I'm just going to say it because I'm not, I don't know when I'll be back here again. So I want to leave you this. When I grew up at nine years old, the first time I realized I'm Mexican, I told my mom I was going to go play with the Mexican kids down the street. And I put this in my comedy. I said, Mom, I'm going to play with the Mexican kids down the street. And she said, you are Mexican. You stay home and play with yourself. <laughs> but I got bored with that. I was worried about going blind. So <laughs> I went down the street and there was this Mexican family and I knew them. They were the Vargases and they sat there and they lived on a chicken ranch. They were there to raise the chickens, the chicken ranch. And to me, they were much more Mexican than I was because first of all, I saw a chicken walk through their front room. A chicken walked through the front room and was watching Sabor Gigante and went and got a Corona from the refrigerator and made himself at home. <laughs> to me, that was a real Mexican. So when I told my mom I would play with those Mexicans down the street, and when she said, you are Mexican, I didn't consider myself that Mexican. I wasn't that Mexican. I was medium Mexican. <laughs> and being light-skinned, and we call that huero. Does anyone know what huero means? Huero means tall, good-looking Latino male. Uh, <laughs> It's what my family calls me and all my people. It's not me. They call me a widow. So there I am, a widow. Tall, light. It's in my book, Almost White, Fourth Confessions of a Latino. So here I am, a widow, tall and light. Because Mexicans, we come out in every shape and color as well. Because my grandmother was Apache. She was indigenous. She was short and dark and brown. And my sister got all that, but I got none of it. I look like an albino to them. <laughs> I look like I came from northern Switzerland near the Alps. I mean, I was really light. So there I was going there, and there was another family that lived up the street from me, and they lived up the street, and, and they were a Mexican family. So there's two families next to my family growing up in La Mesa, California, the table. Grow up in La Mesa. The family, Mexican family lived down the street, and the Mexican family lived up the street. And I remember when moving into La Mesa, there was very few Latinos at that time. We were kind of pioneers. We actually, my, fact, my grandfather grew up in Logan Heights, which is a barrio in San Diego, Logan Heights. He, we were the first Mexican family in that barrio. 
Until that time, that place was just a boring middle class area. Once we moved in, we brought cockfights and cars on, on blocks and things like that, and mariachis playing late at night and barbecues. And, and then the white people left for some reason. <laughs> they called that the Great White Flight of 1932, I think it was. So then we were, and my grandfather was a cockfighter. He actually raised fighting cocks for Anglos. That's not a bad word. It's just, I mean, don't think ouch, but actual roosters. He had raised these roosters. He loved them to death. And so I went from those Mexicans to the ones in La Mesa, Mexicans, who were surrounded by a bunch of middle class people. So we were just three pioneer families. There I was. And I remember going to the schoolyard, and there I was in the schoolyard. I brought my ball with me. I was so happy because I wasn't going to go play with the Mexican kids down the street. I thought I'd just go to my school. So I went to the school. I came there proudly, and I had my, my little ball, and I was playing against the wall. I was playing handball against the wall. And some kid came up to me. His name was Bradley. I remember it so well. I said, hey, that's my ball. And I said, no, it's my ball. He said, no, it's my ball. And I said, no, it's my ball. And he pushed me and he grabbed the ball and he said, well, it's my ball now, wet back. And I'd never heard the term before. It didn't sound like a bad word, dry back, quarterback, half back, wet back. <laughs> so just to play it safe, I just punched him out. <laughs> Turn Oscar de la Hoya on that kid. Knocked him out, he was crying snot bubbles and all that stuff. Looked horrible. He went from really proud, entitled person to just a kid crying on a schoolyard. And I remember the teacher ran up to me. That was my schoolyard teacher. She came up and she said, why'd you hit Bradley? Why'd you hit little Bradley? And I looked up to her and she looked down at me and I said, because he called me a wetback. And she said, are you Mexican? I said, yes. <laughs> well, then you are a wetback. <laughs> True story. Now, don't be offended that I had to use the word wetback. Be offended that that woman called me a wetback. And for years, I wasn't even angry at her. I was like, oh, I'm terribly sorry. I didn't realize I was wetback. Bradley, sorry. Uh, total wetback here. Uh, <laughs> sorry to beat you up for just calling me what I am. I'm wetback. Got it. Just note it. Put it in my head. Got that noted there. Years later, of course, I got upset. And I thought about that. But the name wetback. I started putting it into my, my comedy and I started talking about it because, you know, when you're, when you're young and you're told something, it really affects you. You really remember it. And I remember it and I thought about it. Years later, I was speaking to the National Council of Raza, a big organization, and there was a woman next to me, Elena Ochoa, the first Mexican-American astronaut. And she looks at me and she goes, Rick, Rick. And I said, hello? I'm Elena. Hello, Elena. <laughs> The astronaut! Yes, you're very spacey. Hello. <laughs> Said hello to you again. Hello, Elena. She goes, you don't remember? I grew up with you in La Mesa. My brother was Taya Cho. You went to junior theater with him. That, the first Mexican-American astronaut, was my neighbor. And that little kid down the street who lived on that chicken ranch is Juan Vargas, who's currently a congressman in Congress. So a congressman an astronaut, and me, a writer. Three Mexican families. I gotta say, not too bad for a bunch of wetbacks. Not too bad at all. And when I tell you this story, I only tell you this story because first of all, you don't hear those stories. The media is not telling you about that story. The three Latino families growing up in that area have contributed so much to America. And not just contributed in terms of education and, and opportunity and jobs, but also contributed with our blood. Another story I'll tell you is that my grandfather and my grandmother, they had a, a son, a little guy. Yeah, he was a great, great kid in Boone, Iowa. Poor kid. He had, two, he had two suits. That's all he had. And they named him the best dressed kid in college, in high school. It's high school. Two suits. That's all he had. And my mother just loved him to death. And he got, he got drafted to go to World War II. In fact, he volunteered. And at 17, he signed up to go to World War II. He went to the Philippines. At the Philippines, he was captured by the Japanese when they overran the Philippines. He was forced to march to what they called the Bataan Death March. He marched all the way on up to a POW camp. And in that POW camp, before they released him, they sent a, a, a letter to my grandmother saying, we're about to get your son. We're about to get your son out of the, out of the POW camp. And the Japanese put him in a pit. They threw in gasoline and they machine gunned him to death and lit him on fire. 
a 17-year-old Mexican-American kid from Boone, Iowa, fighting and dying for America. The same time my father was in World War II fighting in Tarawa and some of the worst battles there were. I had many uncles in World War II fighting as well. In fact, my father went to Vietnam and, and was a civil servant there. A civil servant in Vietnam. He went there for the overtime. That's a Mexican work ethic. When you go to Vietnam for the overtime, <laughs> that says a lot about our people. I asked him, I said, when'd you go there? He goes, oh, you know, I went there as a holiday was happening on Tet. I go, you went there during Tet, during the Tet Offensive? Oh yeah, lots of overtime, lots of overtime. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Mexican work ethic people aren't talking about. They're not talking about that when they look at the border. They're not talking about people on the other side. They're not talking about the, the mental anguish of people that are stopped at the border. They're told that they are somehow the other. They are not wanted. They are seen in this way as rapists and drug lords and all those things. And you look at it and you say this, well, is there a problem? Is the border being overrun? You see the pictures, right? You live in the middle of America. You see those pictures? It looks horrible. All these people overrunning the border. They got Zika mosquitoes in one hand. <laughs> they got all sorts of things. They got Ebola virus in their stomachs and all sorts of every other parts of them. They've got, they've got all sorts of, of animals. They're taking your jobs and doing these horrible things. And they're rapists. My God. They're rapists. We're a sexy, romantic people. We speak Spanish, which is a romance language. German and English are a scientific language, which means we can get laid, but we'll never launch a rocket ship. <laughs> That's our story. Blonde, nice. Oh my God, look at them. They're coming over to rape. It's true. Or marry. In my case, I married a beautiful blonde woman. I took her and married her, gave her three kids. I've had to work the entire rest of my life because of that. <laughs> I'm paying my dues every single day with my three children, and they're, and they're half white and they're half Irish. So I call them Mexicans. <laughs> so they're mixed, they're Mexicans. But they speak beautiful Spanish, they really do. I send them to an MLC, which is a Spanish language multicultural learning center, and they learn Spanish. I call it Spanish waterboarding. It's like, oh, hola, hola, agua, get in the water, agua. <laughs> they really remember that, agua. <laughs> of course they get angry at me, you know, daddy, why, why? My son looks at me, he's very wet, he's wetter than me. He looks like, he looks Swedish practically. I look at this kid and I go, remember, you're half Mexican, you're Mexican, and you're Irish, and you're Scottish, and I want you to love every single part of yourself and every single part of your history. I want you to love that and love and accept every part of yourself. Because if you don't, when you look at the Mexican world, since we are a diverse indigenous and also European group or mestizo culture, if you don't love all of yourself, then you're doing every part of yourself a disservice. You think of the mental anguish of the Mexican Americans in California who pay taxes, who give their tax money. And remember this, this is an actual fact. I, I, I checked it before I came here. I looked up uh, facts and myths about, uh, about the border and immigration. Here's one. Latinos don't pay taxes. Undocumented people don't pay taxes. Untrue. According to the, all the organizations I've read on, on the line, such as the business organizations and Chamber of Commerce and all that, they've estimated to leave $100 billion has been left in our Social Security because of undocumented people. $100 billion that they can never take themselves. Because if you use a, a, a Social Security card that's not your own to get a job, they take the, and you put it in the system, they take the money out and they put it back in the social security system. But that system that they put it back in, they can never take it out. So there's a hundred billion dollars in that. And they say right now, if we got rid of every single undocumented person in the United States, that we, social security would not be able to be there for us in our old age. We couldn't afford it. A hundred billion dollars left behind from undocumented people. Are Latinos the problem or are they the solution? If you look at that, they also did another study and they realized that, first of all, the myth is if an undocumented person comes here and takes a job, they're taking a job away from a, a legal American citizen. Untrue. All the statistics go with that say it's completely untrue. And believe me, if you've ever worked in the fields of a strawberry field, you do not want that job. 
I know that because I'm a second generation Mexican American. I would be sitting in a nice cool tree just eating strawberries and just going, it's too much for me. Go ahead, guys. Just I couldn't do it. I've worked with undocumented people and they have a bigger work ethic than I do. I've been domesticated. I don't want to get out in 110 degree weather and pick fruit for people. I don't want to do that at all. But 50% of all the population of the undocumented people in California are the ones picking our fruits and vegetables. And California provides 50% of all the agriculture in the nation. And in fact, when there has been hard immigration against Latinos, such as I think it was Alabama or Georgia, they sat there and said, we need to have harder rules, we need to get rid of these undocumented people, we gotta stop everything. And you know what happened? They lost 35 million in crop failures because no one was there to pick them. 35 million. And the farmers said, oh my God, we need to get people picking this fruit. Our blackberries are, are all these other fruits we need. We don't have anyone. And you know what they found out? They said, why don't you go to the prisons and get the prisoners? The prisoners <laughs> refused. They said, why don't we go to the people on parole and ask them? They refused. And in fact, the UFW did a, did a search one time. They said, if there's an Anglo that will take a job from us, we'll give it to you. They had 12 applicants. None of them showed up. 12. So this border we're talking about, this border that's here, really, in a strange way, is an unnatural border. And if you look at borders and what they mean, think about it, the Great Wall of China did not work. Great Wall of China did not work, and no, Matt Damon was not part of that Great Wall of China. That's a Hollywood lie. They, they show that in the movies coming out about the Great Wall. That didn't work. The Berlin Wall didn't work. Guess what? In China, they put up the, the Great Wall to stop Mongolians. There was a Mongolian emperor within a generation. The Great Wall didn't work. The Berlin Wall didn't work. And in some ways, I look at it and say, the wall they want to build now isn't working. They're not coming up with the real answers. Immigration reform and things like that. Because to say we want immigration reform talks to a constituency that believes that the Latinos are the problem, not the solution. I was recently in Israel just last week, and this is how my schedule is. I, I was in Israel for a week, and there are walls there. And I was reminded about this, and I thought, here I'm coming here, and I saw the big walls there. And there was a big wall, and it kept off a, a, a Palestinian area. And I went into the settlements, I went to the Golan Heights, and they had the army. I was invited by the Minister of Strategic Affairs, and somehow it's strategic for me to go there and see all this. And I was reminded about our own walls here. The difference is that wall was put up there. And even while I was there, there was a stabbing of two policemen about a block away from me. Even with my security and bodyguard next to me. Two blocks away. That's where it was, stabbing. And I thought about that and I said, wait a minute. When you wall people up and you keep them pent in the area and you make almost a prison. And I went to the Holocaust Museum and I looked at it and I remembered the ghetto of Warsaw when they put the Jews in that ghetto and they put a wall around them. And when you keep putting walls around people, that doesn't allow for bridges. It doesn't allow for understanding. It doesn't allow for one country and one culture to be better together. Do you realize that in Mexico, presents has more engineers graduated, I think, per capita than Germany? Than Germany. Engineers are coming out of Mexico. Commerce is happening in Mexico. Mexico is great. And when I see someone on the CNN, and I, a guy saying, I'm scared of tacos on every corner. Remember that guy? There's, good, there's a dominant culture, there's going to be tacos on every corner. And he was very Mexican, he was much more Mexican than I was. And he said that and I thought, tacos on every corner, that's just delicious. <laughs> <laughs> I can go, you know, there's a very, uh, Seattle's a streaming dominant culture. You better watch it, there's going to be a Starbucks on every corner if you're not careful. <laughs> that's business. That's commerce. That's cultural trade. All the things that make people want to grow and live. And the only solution I saw when I was in Israel that I really took a look at was in an area of Samaria where there were Jewish business had employed Arabic people. Remember, Israel has about two million uh, uh, Arabs, is Israeli Arabs. They're Muslim, two million. America has 55 million Latinos. We could have had a big quinceanera party, it could be 56 by the time I'm done with that statistic. <laughs> but 55 million Latinos. 
That's an amazing amount of Latinos. That's an amazing amount of people that if we educate, if we get behind, if we open the door, if we encourage them, imagine the power of 55 million people, how that opens jobs for us. And people says, you know, we need a secure border. We need a secure border. You know what country has a secure border? North Korea, very secure border. Do you realize people still smuggle people in and out of North Korea with that border? With, with landmines and dogs and everything else, still it doesn't hold people back. That border doesn't work. And the way is when you look and they say, we're gonna build a bigger, bigger wall. I think ironic because normally we're really great at tunnels if you really wanna know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't build the wall up, build it down. <laughs> That's how, that's how our guy got out of, out of prison, El Chapo, <laughs> tunneled. We have an amazing tunneling ability. They should have called us for that tunnel that went between France and England. We would have took that in a day or two. No problem at all. But do you see what I'm talking about? How the border, when you see those signs and you see that world, what it says to you subconsciously? If I sat there and came back from Nebraska and said, let me tell you about Nebraska, oh, those people. They noodle, they put their hand, they put it under a rock in the lake or the river, and they pull out a catfish. And there's Miss Noodle, the queen of the catfish area in those places, and they noodle. That's what they do. And over here in Nebraska, they're taking, they come to California, they're gonna bring a lot of overpopulation. And we're gonna have worse and worse traffic because those Nebraskans invading California. And they said that back in the day during the Dust Bowl. They called them Okies. And they're terrified of these Okies coming over. And what they do? They made our agricultural industry in California. What the Latinos do? We're the ones that pick the fruit, pick the strawberries, give you the great music, good looking guys, <laughs> great looking women. We want to be a part of this country in such a great way that if you embrace us, and you let that border fall because I really believe that there should be a bridge, not a border. And a border is something that, that we share. Not let it be something that separates us. Not let it be something that makes us any further apart from each other. You look at it and you sit there and you think and they hear the words about Latinos that were taking over or doing all that. It's me. Two generations. That's your Latino. Two generations, it's me. Not too bad. I guarantee you, I pay a lot in taxes. I pay a lot of money in taxes. I got three kids that are beautiful, they're Mexicans. I got a beautiful, wonderful wife. I'm in America, I'm buying real estate. I'm here, we're all here, and we are the solution. So when I see that border and I look at the border and I realize the, the problems it causes. See, right now, if we took a border, we said they estimated that it would cost billions of dollars to build the border that Donald Trump wants. Billions of dollars. And there's net immigration, zero immigration. In other words, there's less Latinos coming to the United States now than ever. So you don't really need the wall. Just sounds like to me a lot of Hollywood hype. And when you think about it, the wall's not going to make you safer. The wall's not going to make it better for you. In fact, one of our largest trading partners, bigger than I think France and England combined, is Mexico. The money that the Mexicans send here and send back to Mexico. There's tourism, there's oil, and there's remittance. There's people that live here, send money back to Mexico. And you know what those people do in Mexico with that money? They buy Frigidaire. They buy John Deere. They buy Maytag. They buy all those things that America manufactures. Sounds like a great relationship between people. Commerce, business, cultural exchange. This young, vibrant Latino groups, and believe me, I'm not that young. I really want to see a young demographic growing up because right now we see in China, and what we see in Japan, actually, in Japan, they have very little immigration. Now whole cities are collapsing in Japan because there's not enough people to fill them. They have an aging, aging group of people that are looking at the country, and we kind of have the same problem. So we need immigration more than ever. We always will. So when I look at the border, I feel my own personal stories. I look at my family who fought and died for this country. I, I look at that wall and I think to myself how that wall separates us and it shouldn't. But worse yet, the toll that it really brings 
is it makes so many young Latino people feel that they're the uninvited guests to America. Imagine, if you will, you go to a wedding. You don't know if your name's on the place. You don't know if you're really invited there. That's kind of what happens to Latinos. And even I can look at myself and go, wait a minute, Rick, you're, you're a documented, legal Latino. You came over in 1910. You fought for this country. You're all those things. And I have to tell you, yes, I'm an American. Proud American. I've gone overseas to entertain the troops in, in Diego Garcia. I did stand up for people out of Afghanistan. Our troops that went on over there, I relate to them because my family's died for this country. And I'm Mexican American. But when they say undocumented people, I'm not that far from them. I have compassion. My mother was a, was a waitress. I didn't grow up rich. I grew up five kids in one bedroom. And my mother was a waitress. And every time I speak at Deus's, and I've spoken at the World Bank, I've spoken at all these different places, and I'm out there, and I look out there in the audience, and I see a banquet waitress filling someone's coffee. And I think of my mother, who used to take home leftovers. I used to kid her when she'd take home leftovers. I'd say, Mom, there's a cigarette butt in my steak. She'd get real upset. No, it's never on a table. It's not. And I would kid her mercilessly. But you know something? She worked two jobs for me. My father worked three jobs. He was a door-to-door -door salesman. And those people, my family, taught me how to survive in Hollywood. They taught me a Mexican work ethic, which is the same as a Midwestern work ethic. My father taught me a very simple thing. I mean, now remember, I've written in Living Color, I've written all these different shows. And to get there, and it's statistically, it's harder for a Latino in Hollywood than any other group. And my father told me one thing, and I'll leave this with you. My dad would say, Rick, every time I go out there, I knock on the doors. I say, hey, you want to buy pots and pans? And they shove the door, and they say, no. And I walk to another house, and I knock on the door. You want to buy pots and pans? They shove the door closed, no. I walk to maybe 80 houses, and they all say no. But around the 81st house, they say yes. You have to hear a lot of no's before you hear that one yes. That's what my father taught me. And that's how I was able to keep surviving and thriving in Hollywood. I don't mind the no's. I don't mind the no's, but I just want people to understand me. And that's why I talk. I believe everyone wants to be understood. I believe there's a better chance for all of us to get along together and somehow build this great country. Together. Not split up. Not against each other, not fearful, but seeing every one of us as part of each other. Every one of our issues is the same. We all want to be understood. We all want to raise a family. We all want to make some money. We all want to provide. And I look at those Mexican immigrants across the border, guys that have been 5,000 miles in Guatemala or places like that who are willing to walk. And I experienced it recently when McFarland, in this uh, place, there was a, not McFarland, it was a another area in California. What they did is, it was undocumented miners that crossed the border. And they picked them up, and they took them to an ICE place, which is uh, the, the homeland security. They're undocumented miners. These are little nine-year-old kids, some 13 years old. They're trying to avoid war and, and, and being killed by death squads and things like that. They travel all these miles all the way up to California, and when they cross, they're arrested. The sad thing about it, is I was at this big rally, and there's two different groups. There was the one group saying, illegal, illegal, stop the kids, stop the kids. And there was another group going, hey, compassion, let's find immigration reform, all these thousand things. And I remember these two men were arguing with each other, and one guy had a, had a flag that had been wrapped together, and he held it in his hand. It almost looked like a spear, like he could stab someone with his flag. It was a pointy thing. There was another guy yelling at him, and they weren't listening to each other. And they turned to me, and they said, which side are you on? Which side are you on? Because I'm a huero. I look like I could be on either side. <laughs> I like being a huero because I can always cut myself out of any camp they put me into. It's my one little thing. But I sit there and I go, I said, you know what side I'm in? I'm on the side of the children. The side of the children. And that stopped them. And the man with the flag had been wrapped up. He said, oh, I, I was yelling at him because he was, he was yelling at me. And the guy said, I was yelling at you to tell you to unwrap your flag. It's disrespectful to have a flag wrapped up. You see, I had gone to Afghanistan. 
and I served two, three tours there. He told him that. The man looked and said, you know, I, I was a Marine in Iraq. I'm sorry. And they apologized to each other. And that's the solution. When people can recognize the humanity in each other, we won't have this problem. We won't see the Latinos as the, almost like Game of Thrones. You know that show Game of Thrones? I know the kids will. You know Game of Thrones? They have a big wall, right? And were they out keeping out of the big wall? The white walkers. Same wall, we're keeping out the brown walkers. There's the big difference there. <laughs> we're terrified of the brown walkers. They're crossing over, they're taking jobs, there's murderers, they're rapists, there's all these horrible things that gets told you time and time again. And after a while, you don't question it. After a while, your ground is softened up for real racism and, and hatred to come about. And that's not the America that I came here for. My father was in Vietnam. My father was in World War II. I'm an American. And I'm a Latino and I've lived on the border. And I can tell you, we need bridges more than we need borders. Thank you. So, I wanted to open this part up to you because I, I really wanted people to ask questions. And I'm, I'm serious, you can ask me any question. Well, there's, I really don't see questions as bad. I see questions as really good. This is my favorite part about talking. And I'll tell you my own story. I was on a train, come, uh, speaking at Harvard, and so I was on a train, and right next to me were two Jewish guys sitting across from me. And I mean they were Jewish. They had Paisleys and the whole thing, and <laughs> they were the most Jewish looking guys I'd ever seen. They're sitting across from me, and I'm sitting there, and I got four hours in the train. I look at them, and I go, hey, what's it like being Jewish? And the guy looks at me and goes, boy, no one's ever asked me that question. This is amazing. Well, let me tell you. And he sat there and talked for four hours about being Jewish. In fact, I invited him to CBS to come visit me. He got his picture in the Star Trek set and these other different things. <laughs> total, total orthodox. And he gave me some kugel, which is great, which is like a, a great Jewish pastry thing. It's delicious. And he gave me that and he said, thank you. And he gave me a hug and, and, and talked. And it was a beautiful moment. And that's what these questions and answers are. Ask me anything you want to know. And believe me, I always ask questions. I had a friend of mine who was a billionaire. This woman's a billionaire, and I turned to her and she turned to me and she goes, what's it like being Mexican? <laughs> and I said, what's it like being really filthy rich? I mean, you, <laughs> you can buy anything you want. You can just, there's no car you can't afford. And she said, it's a lot of responsibility. And I took that in. I, I ran a political campaign for her. It's a good woman. Uh, um, Molly Munger. Her father's Charles Munger, and his partner is um, Warren, Warren Buffett, yeah, you know that. <laughs> Nebraska. I was on his, I got to be on his yacht. It was beautiful. They invited me to be on his yacht. And uh, I remember I brought my kids. There was only two Mexicans on that yacht. <laughs> it was such a rich yacht. It was all white people serving us. It was amazing. I was like, oh my God, this is rich. It was great. I had a great time. And I, I saw him and they said, what's, what, what's Charles Munger like? I go, he's really relaxed. And he just sold a business, I think he made 250 million that day. So it's like, he should be relaxed. So ask me any questions. You want to ask questions? Is this microphone yep. to take it around? Okay, take it around. So before I take it to anyone, I do have one note. It says, hey, so Office of Multicultural Affairs told their scholarship students to sign in. Okay, so just so you know that before you go. So I'm Michelle Warren from the Department of Modern Languages, and I'm here to take your questions. So I, I can't agree with more. I, I thank you for coming and speaking to us. For a long time, it seemed like, and, and of course this is somewhat media, but the US and, and Mexico and a lot of the Latin countries have, have had a bridge with uh, combating drugs. So if you open up this, you know, the, the wall and you create more bridges and whatnot, how do you, how do you combat this, this great, great question. terrible problem? No, great question. Here's the, here, here. oh, good, right here, okay. Now it looked like a big speaker. Hello. Academic. Yeah, academic. I feel like I'm testifying at my trial. I don't know what was in my bags. I'm sorry. Um, there's uh, something there. I'll, t I'll tell you how. Now, this is a, this is a different thing. I, I really believe this differently. I, I understand drugs in a... a I work in Hollywood, so I really understand drugs. <laughs> Who better to fight drugs than me? So... <laughs> um, Drugs, I, f I feel, really, in a lot of ways, are a medical problem. It's an addiction. 
and, and I think if people start treating it as an addiction, as a health issue, all those things, it's a better way to, to do it than criminalize it so much. That's number one. Uh, number two, I think when we've stopped drugs, now you understand, what's coming back now to the, to the South is uh, we had an epidemic of Oxycontin. You ever heard about Oxycontin? Uh, it's a true story, I had a brain uh, um, surgery twice last year, two brain surgeries. So I was using it against all my friends, like people would walk up to me and I'd say, I don't remember you had a brain surgery. It's not true, I, I remembered them, I just was being rude about it. Uh, <laughs> And I remember after getting out of the surgery, I, I was kidding my wife. I was like, thank you for praying for me. <laughs> Obviously, you didn't do a good job. Uh, but it was pretty horrible. Uh, but I have to say that I, I really believe that in a lot of ways, um, the drug problem is, is really more of a medical issue in a lot of ways. It's, it's, a, it's a medical issue and uh, should be treated such as one. Because right now, when Oxycontin took over, say, places like the uh, Appalachian Mountains and things like that, and they called it, you know, hillbilly heroin. Now what's happening is hill, it's heroin's coming into that area because it's cheaper than Oxycontin. People like drugs. Our nation was founded on addiction, basically. Tobacco, Jamestown, tobacco. Nicotine, it's a drug. You add, start adding sugar to that, you start adding all the things we had, whiskey taxes, all those thousand things. We have had this in our society, and if we don't sit there and look at it more of a way to, to combine it as, as really more of a health issue, they've worked it in Portugal and places like that where they've treated it not as, as, as a criminal issue, but a health issue, it's worked. So when we say to talk about opening the border more, there's many ways that the border can be opened where we have fast service in the border. You're still gonna find people with drugs. The, the need for drugs in America is huge. Why, we live in a country that you are given drugs every single minute. Do you realize that? Walk, walk into a Starbucks, what do you think is what's there? You see that, the, that, that energy drinks? How many people do you know that are, are, are on uh, Red Bull? Energy drinks like that. Isn't that a drug, if you think about it? We need to see real change within our culture to affect it that way. But I do not see a, a looser border as a way for drugs to get in, because it's a different kind of, of uh, policing than looking at an undocumented people. Most undocumented people do not cross the border by foot. They overstay their visas. They come by planes. They don't cross the border like that. They don't. There's a horrible border that kills people in the deserts and people are die. Most undocumented people come by plane. And oh, guess what? Most people that are immigrants that are, undoc are documented or whatever, a uh, high percentage have, have doctorates, more so than a, a, a native born person here in America. So what's the great thing? America is getting the best and brightest coming to this country. And if not the best and brightest, the hardest working. Sounds like a pretty darn good deal for America. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I mean, to some degree, I'm just, the drug cartels have so much power in these developing countries. We haven't been able to, you know, using, like your analogy of using a bridge, to work together and the enemy will squash that. I worry that, you know, it's looser, that give them more power, but I, I think your answer is great. Yeah, they, they, they have it where, where in, in Mexico the, the power's been done. I mean, I can look at America and say, you know, there's an old joke in Mexico. There was, a, there was a American politician. He goes to Mexico. He says, you could come to America because we got a computer system that's amazing. We can tell within 24 hours who the next president of the United States will be. And the Mexican politician says, that's nothing. We know before the election. <laughs> So we joke about things like that, and we see it, but it's also that. We see, we see narco money in politics, but again, I look at America and I see corporate money in politics. Either way, money brings influence. So we should get a lot of the money out of politics, just the same way that they should get the narco money out of their politics as well. New question. Anyone? Bueller? Yes. As a Hispanic, like in the entertainment industry right now, I know I've been reading different articles and stuff where like racism is so like they sneak it in under everything. And so, is there anything that like for you to try and actively combat that, or is it basically one of those things that you have to like shake your fist and rage as it happens? 
Oh, I never shake my fist and do that. <laughs> to me, uh, at CBS they say, oh, look at Rick, he's, he's always fighting against the man. And I'm going, no, I'm fighting for the man. I'm actually fighting for America by including more people. You got to understand, most uh, shows that are done with diverse casts do better in the ratings. They do better in their politics. They do better. So I'm fighting for this guy to say, let me give you more audience. Put a diverse group in there. So you have to kind of approach it that way. What never works is turning to someone and going, you're prejudiced, you're this, you're that, without a solution. If you say, hey, do you want to have a better box office? Why don't you include these people? They're, they're just going to broaden your thing. And if I say to people, you want a better writer's room? I, the writer's room I worked on for East Los High had uh, a black woman, two gay men, a uh, Puerto Rican woman, and me. And me, I was the straight guy. So I had, uh, they would ask me, would a straight guy say that? I, Absolutely not. <laughs> no, we're not inviting anyone to Golden Girls, you know, reunion or things like that. But, but I had a diverse point of view and they did too and we all added it to a better show. And the executive producer's Cuban. So I look at it that way and I go, you know, the best way to fight Hollywood is to keep saying, look what you're doing wrong. Look at my program, 65 series regulars, Kate McKenna, you know, Nassim Patrat, all these people, stars have come from my show. Anyone see the movie Keanu? Recently, they came out, Key and Peele, they're huge comedians. I worked with them in Mad TV. Well, the lead woman came out of my program as well, Tiffany Haddish, and she auditioned for me four years in a row. And the people in the, uh, the Superstore uh, as well. So, you know, Hollywood is a very small community. My children, uh, Edward James Olmos is my, f my son's and daughter's godfather. So it's a small world, we all know each other. But even with that, a lot of times people do, I call it lazy casting. That's all it is. When you think about it, you go, hey, when you go, I would like to have a professional. Maybe if you were casting directors, you'd go, why not Rick Nahara? He's a professional. And that changes it. So you have to keep putting those images out there because we get eight hours a day of that. Remember when, uh, what was it, uh, Morgan Fre Freeman played the president? Do you guys remember that? I remember when I saw it, I was like, wow, Morgan Freeman's a president of the United States. And I went, it's possible. <laughs> as strange as that sounds, to have that visual is so effective. So yes, I, I constantly, I don't shake my fist, I, I look for ways. Over 65 series regulars have come from my show. My show Latino Logs had over 250 Latino actors. Two of them went to Broadway, Jaime Camille, who's now on Jane the Virgin, and Eugenio Debez, who wrote uh, Instructions Not Included the biggest Spanish language film of all time, raking in millions of dollars for America. We are the solution. Can yeah. I have another question? I've come to this side of the auditorium. Um, I have two more questions. Well, um, my name is Camille. I've been here 20 years from Israel. Ah, oh, I'm just in Israel. Yep. Uh, I am an Israeli uh, Mm -hmm. We Arabs are a mix of Christians and Muslims. Yes. We're a family of uh, Catholics. Mm -hmm. Been here 20 years, as I said. Um, definitely believe in bridges. Um, if you think about the majority of the people in this room, at some point they immigrated here. Yeah. And they had the opportunities to build their families, build their dreams. So, it's, it's life, it's science, it's the cycle of life. And I'm positive that I've been working for the last uh, five years with almost uh, 300 people, 80% Mexicans. You the, the hotels? No. Okay. Because <laughs> there's an Israeli guy who has a bunch of ho a hotel and staying at Israeli. Uh, I know him well. Oh, you do? Okay. Um, Did, Shashuka? What's that stuff at the breakfast I love there? Shashuka. Yeah, that's the yeah. best. <laughs> but um, I work for uh, Portland in Lexington. 80% mm -hmm. um, Mexicans, extremely horrible. Yes. And, uh, you know, they, they want to have a life, a uh, future, like all of us. So, um, you know, I definitely think bridges uh, is the key. And as an Arab Israeli that lives in Israel, that seeing bridges torn apart, I hope that we don't make these mistakes and, and build these bridges here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. You know, a lot of people don't see that because what, what you know, Trump recently said, oh, look at Israel, they got bridges, the borders up there and it's doing great. It's not doing great. It, it won't do great. It's just, if anything, it, it just holds people back and that gives them a chance to get more angry, more enraged, and figure out better ways to kill you. 
So it's not helping. It's only hurting. Yes, right there. Are you guys all having fun right now with this? Yeah. Okay. We're going to talk some real stuff tonight. So um, besides your comedy, your writing, and um, your presentations that you give like this one, what else, how else do you contribute to your community? Or how do you give back? Good question. You caught me there. Okay. <laughs> Taking advantage of my community for years. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I think in a lot of ways, uh, part of it is leadership. You know, two of my cousins are married to Cesar Chavez's daughters. My, I'm on the board of FIELD, which is an organization created by Cesar Chavez. It's uh, farm workers. It helps farm workers for education, uh, leadership, and development. I'm on the board of that. Uh, I have three children that are studying and doing, getting A's, and my son is already working as an actor. He just made money last week, more than I did, surprisingly enough. Uh, even though I taught him everything he knows. Um, and I, I, think, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I serve on a lot of different committees, I'm all, all that stuff, but I don't do that and I would normally never say that because I, I don't believe that's something to be applauded. I think it's something that just should be done. You know, I'm on the board of uh, many organizations. I help on different things. Uh, my wife and I just raised money for Corazon de Vida and another orphanage. So that handles 11 orphanages in, in uh, Mexico. My wife is just in Mexico. So she's in Mexico while I was here. And actually, we had to hire a person for our children. So we create a lot of jobs. I think in my case, I've created more jobs in America single-handedly as a Latino than most people have. I, I'm only me. There isn't an organization behind me. And what, 250 actors have gone through my program, have been on stage, have been paid, have paid money into the system, have had a career. I think that's pretty darn good, actually, and I'm, I'm proud of that. But the books I write, the, uh, the speeches I do, the op-eds, all that stuff, it helps because I just want a better America for everybody. That's really it. I want a better America for everybody. I remember I was in the riots. Remember the riots back in 92 or something like that? Quick story, I was in the riots, and uh, not in the riots, like taking sunscreen and crap like that from supermarkets. <laughs> It was, uh, I was teaching a class and I was wearing a nice suit and I was teaching a class and I walk outside and I, that day I'd been playing, uh, I had a new CD player and I was playing CDs so I had no radio. And when they said the verdict, all of a sudden I, you know, I came out of my class, no one showed up for some reason. I'm like, this is, these people have no sense of commitment to the art. Why aren't they here? And I didn't realize they had all known there was this verdict. So I walk out and I heard gunshots and fires and smoke everywhere and I remember clearly, I got attacked. There was four Latinos and five black guys walking toward me. And I thought, how great, blacks and Latinos together. I was so happy to see that. <laughs> and then, of course, they jumped me and started hitting me. And then I had to turn real ghetto. <laughs> so, I won't say what I said, but it's pretty explicit. Because <laughs> they said, let's get this white boy. And that pissed me off. I'm like, I am not white. <laughs> I'm Mexican. You want some piece of meat? Come on, fool. You know, and they're like, oh, the white guy got possessed by a Mexican. Let's run away. <laughs> so they, they ran away. Um, so, I mean, I, th I think that's, that's giving a lot back to my community. And believe me, I've not always been liked by the Latino community. But I had a lot of people not like me when I first came to L.A. Because there is a certain thought within the Latino community of be humble. Don't ask for more. Don't do that. And I remember a Chicano group came up to me. They look at you, Aguero and all that crap. Look at you. Don't speak Spanish too good. Look at you. I, they go, then it was, I was joining Mecha. And they said, we don't think you felt enough pain or oppression in your lifetime to join a movement of Sudan Chicago say, Aslan. And I said, Zochi Milcho, does right now count? Because I'm feeling prejudice. And it stunned him. And at one point, the guy says to me, he goes, you just want to be successful, don't you? And I said, yes, I do. He admitted it. <laughs> and that's what I have to do, self-reflection on my own culture, and say, hey, guys, you know, be successful. That's your right. This is your necessity. You've left Mexico, and you understand this. Mexicans who leave Mexico, we're not that loyal to Mexico. We're loyal to whoever loves us and treats us with respect. And we're overly loyal. And a lot of Mexicans left Mexico because the government, the situation down there, and the, because of racism and things like that, they're not able to move ahead. And I said opposite to the Cubans. Cubans, a lot of the white Cubans who aren't African-American or, or Afro-Cubano came to Miami fleeing Castro. So they were the professional class. And in Mexico, a lot of times you can't move up, you have to leave. And they've left, and they've contributed to this country, and they've contributed back to Mexico. So 
I continue to contribute, and, and that's all I can do. So that's, I think, is that enough for my people? Okay, Whew, man. You haven't done enough for us, okay. <laughs> Another question. So as a Latino professional, what kind of last stating is this for you? What kind of what? Last stating. Discrimination. Latino? What do I like to be called? No, as a, as a professional. Yes. Are there any limitations for you? That sure. Like there's, there's plenty of limitations, but you just don't concentrate on them. Honestly, you have to look at it this way. If I look at the, the I am the only, the first Latino who had a successful play on Broadway. Imagine the odds of that. And I put it together by not thinking that no Latino had ever done it before. I just wanted to be the one that did it. So it was my own personal thing. So a lot of times when they make a, a statement, I always like to break it. My wife always kids me because I, she always says I cross that line. I'll say a joke and I'll really make it under, <laughs> you know, really bad right afterwards. She goes, you just love crossing that line, don't you? But I've just had to cross that line my entire life. I have dyslexia. I can't, I can't see like other people do in terms of writing and re words. So here I am, an award-winning author, an actual two WJ nominations, work as a writer. Right now I'm writing a screenplay for, uh, with another writer for Rosalind Sanchez, and, and I'm, I just came off of two seasons of East Los High, and I'm at CBS. All that, I never let having dyslexia stop me. I never let being flunked in school stop me. I never let anything stop me. I had no opportunity for an excuse. And in that way, you have to have blinders on. I look at my son and I realize, and my children, I mean, they're given the keys to a whole world that I would never had. But then again, I tell them how they should be appreciative and how they should be kind to everyone around them and how to be a gentleman and a lady and all those thousand things. My job is to teach them so they take over my job, succession. So yeah, there are big, big, Big blocks, but you just can't let them stop you. Do we have time for another question? Sure, whatever you guys want. I'm, I'm, you, um, my speech is you, your speech. Me, me speech is su speech. <laughs> so whatever you want to ask me, this is the time. Hi. Um, well, you kind of answered this question already, but um, like, what advice would you give us, young, yep. adults, like young people, like on how to make an impact in our community or in our families? Uh, that's a good question. You know what I'd say? I would tell every young Latino I meet how to love themselves. And we're not used to that. We're not used to looking at ourselves and saying, you're beautiful. Wow, or encouraging each other. Do you ever see, do you ever Latinos ever encourage each other? Honestly, as Latinos, I'm gonna let Anglos in on a secret, okay? So this is all, this is secret Latino stuff we're gonna tell right now. <laughs> how many times do you see Latinos praising other Latinos? We call it invidia. You know, look at you, rich, got money. <laughs> it should be, look at you, rich, got money, great. That's fantastic, so proud of you. Like, give me a hug. <laughs> you know, that's the different thing. It's just taking something and treating it differently. So I would tell every Latino, uh, love every other Latino. If you can love other people, it's easy to love everyone else. I don't look at a world where, where I don't include other people. My wife is, Anglo and her, her parents are Anglo and, and guess what? Her, their son is married to a Mexican girl. She's married to a Mexican-American guy. And we've made some really beautiful children that are extremely talented. And look how we've contributed to America. That's the stories we don't get told and that's what we have to tell. So I tell young Latinos, praise each other. Praise each other and encourage each other. Because if you don't do it, why should someone else do it? You should know them better. So praise. And I say this. Like I told you the story about knock on the door, you're gonna get used to hearing no. As for everything you see up on that video about me, well, oh, he's done this, he's done that. Every single one of those yeses, there's at least 100 no's behind it. 100 no's, I lose to richer, more famous people than me every single day. Seth MacFarlane just beat me out of a, of a show I was doing because he's Seth MacFarlane. Doesn't matter, next year I may beat him. It's always upward, always thinking positive. It's always putting it together because negativity is easy to bring you down. It's the easiest thing to do to give up. Don't give up. Don't give up on yourself. Because there's a reason. There's a reason you're here. And I sell it to everyone. 
I'm a kid from La Mesa, California. How did I get to Broadway? How did I get to write movies? How did I get to do TV shows? How did you, with these odds against me, incredible odds, I just never thought about the odds. I thought about the objective. If your objective is to get an education, if your objective is to contribute to America, if your objective is to contribute to your family and build people up, then don't let anything get in that way. The objective. Yes. I want to add one thing here. When you asked over here what Rick contributed back to his community, he's done probably single-handedly more than any other Latino to open the door for Latinos to be reflected in Hollywood culture and our media and our Broadway plays. And that in and of itself is great. And he does things like come to Kearney, Nebraska to talk to us. And I hope you see yourselves reflected in him because this is this is today's Latinos. And I'm so proud and happy that you came tonight. And um, I'd like to give you a round of applause. And thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I will say this, I will say this, I am not extraordinary. I'm a very simple guy that does extraordinary things. And I can say that for everyone else in this room. Don't worry, you don't need to be extraordinary. You are extraordinary, you just have to recognize it. I'm dyslexia, bad in school, flunked in kindergarten, I'm a mess. <laughs> one of the, you know, not in the best shape I've ever been. I don't know. Just don't concentrate on that. Concentrate on what you can do. And uh, thank you so much for having me at your community. I mean, I've been embraced by this community. I love it. I saw a turkey over here. Um, that was amazing to me to see a turkey. You can actually catch them, I guess, but <laughs> no one would let me kill that turkey for some reason. I saw food and I wanted it, but uh, they stopped that primordial instinct of mine. And you've got, you know, a great organization and great people, and, and I wanted to say, anytime you need me back, I'll come back, because you have a great town. Thank you. Yeah. Is that, is that enough? Excellent.